is Outgrowing the Cloud. This is going to be more of an experience report of my experiences. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, by way of introduction, uh, this is me. Uh, if you've seen my picture on there, hello. Uh, my name is Mike Moore, um, and my handle I go by is Blomage, Blomage, doesn't matter how you say it. I work at a company called Bloomfire, and uh, we have a really great team, and we're doing lots of fun things. Uh, we really enjoy our time at Bloomfire. And also, we're hiring, so you know, if you're looking for a job, Kobe, come talk to me. Uh, one of the things I've been kind of known for is I uh, run Mountain West Ruby Conference. And uh, so, by show of hands, how many people are planning on going to Mountain West in two weeks? Oh, wow. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so, I'm super excited for this, for this year at Mountain West. Um, but if you look at our logo, like every time I look at it, it's like just so literal and I just don't like it, so we're going to change that and hopefully we'll have that by the time the conference comes around. But I'm not here to talk about Mountain West, I'm here to talk about the cloud. So, let's talk about the cloud. Everybody loves the cloud. I like this cloud because it's got a butt in the lower right hand side. <laughs> um, but the cloud offers an awful lot. It makes it super easy to, to stand up a new application. Uh, it makes it easy to provision new hardware and to grow and scale. Um, but I know the majority of you are like, yeah, it's fun for work, but the best thing about the cloud is that's where Rainbow Dash lives, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Rainbow Dash is the coolest out of all ponies, am I right? And how much cooler? 20% cooler. <laughs> all right, so show of hands, are there any bronies in the audience? One. All right. Everybody else, you might want to go get a beer because it's not going to get any better for you. <laughs> All right. So uh, this is a really simple kind of diagram showing uh, like a, uh, an information architecture, systems architecture. On top we have the web server. On the bottom we have the database server. I'm going to color coordinate those, color code them, so that they're easier to just pick out. So blue will be web, red will be database. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the things that we end up doing a lot is we want to, you know, put multiple web servers in case one falls over. And when we do that, we have to put a load balancer up there in front of it, and that will be green. So, and this is, you know, the very, really typical approach to building an application, putting out available for people to hit. Um, and then. Eventually, we'll want to scale. We'll have like you know maybe a master-slave database, and eventually, we're going to have multiple web application servers to accommodate the load, and we put them all on the cloud. And when I started at Bloomfire, this is actually where we were. We were on the cloud, and it worked really, really well for us. So we have a user out there on the internet. He'd request something from our our load balancer. Load balancer would hand it off the web server. Web server would ask the database, get all the data, package it up, send it back to the user. And that worked really well, and I had no problems with it. Almost. Well, I'm actually a big believer in PDD. Is anybody else here a believer in PDD? You guys know what I'm talking about? It's pain driven development, right? I don't like solving problems until I actually have a need and I need to solve it. So, the first pain I had with this was dealing with customer domains. We sell service. Our customers want to put that service on their own domain. And that works really easily, right? You uh, have a user, they ask for something on bloomfire.com and we respond to it. But then we have a corporate user and they ask for something on their customer domain name. And, you know, that should work in most cases. But you guys know when this doesn't work? This doesn't work when you have to use HTTPS, right? And the reason that doesn't work is because you have to do everything over SSL and you actually have to send the certificate before they actually, you actually say what the request is that you're looking for, right? Before you give the domain name that you're looking for, you have to send the certificate signed with that domain name, which means that we need to have a separate IP. And that was our problem. So, you know, users come in for Bloomfire, they go to one load balancer. Users come in for customer domain name, they go to another load balancer. And unfortunately, our cloud provider did not have a way to have multiple IPs either on a single single instance, and the cheapest single IP product they offered was like $80 a month, which is pretty steep when we're only charging $100 a month for the service. You know, you want four-fifths of, of what revenue we have coming in paying just for the load balancer. So that was a pain, and we needed to solve that because we were going to 
we weren't going to stay in business very long if we kept doing that. The second pain we had was customer whitelists. And again, corporate customers, they want us to go and to hit their services, you know, usually for uh, authentication, but for other things, other types of integration. So we have a corporate user, and then in the upper right-hand corner, you can see that's the corporate network with the evil smokestacks. <laughs> so the user makes a request into our cloud, our product offering. We go off to the web server, we hit our database server, but then we also have to go up and we have to talk to some external resource that's behind a corporate firewall. And we can do that because they whitelisted our IP and, we, and they let us in. But as we get more and more popular, all of a sudden, we need to add capacity. So, oh, we had to add a new web server. And because all of our, our servers are in the cloud, they've got a public IP, uh, when a new request comes in, hands off to that web <coughs> server, we hit the database, then we hit their corporate repository, we hit their whitelist, and then it just fails spectacularly. So we can't get in, because we have to update that whitelist. So every time we add a new customer, every time we add a new, uh, a new server, we have to go and have them update their whitelist. And as we keep adding new, more and more customers, and we keep scaling and adding more and more servers, that was going to become a real problem. So that was our second, our second pain. And this, is, this isn't really a pain. This is just mostly a concern. This is just something that I don't like. Um, so yeah, it's a mental pain more than anything. Uh, we're all out there on the cloud, and we can have requests come into our web balancer, and that's just fine. But you can actually hit directly hit our web server, right? If you knew the IP and you knew the port that we were using from the load balancer, and even worse, you could hit our database, right? And there's just something about that that I'm just not very comfortable with. So we wanted to make a change. We wanted to kind of grow beyond what we we're currently doing on the cloud. But to do that, we really had to master five things. We had to make sure that we could do these five things. The first was networking, right? And I'm not going to belabor this point because I think this is a self-selecting group and we all probably know everything. You guys are probably smarter about networks than I am because I'm totally faking it. Um, but the first thing is we had to understand subnets, right? And what we really want to have is we want a, a, a small logical group uh, network that nothing can access unless it goes through a router. We specifically give it permissions. And we also have to make sure we understand how DNS looks if we're going to change our, uh, our cloud offering. So if you're looking to make this type of change, you need to make sure you understand those two things. The next thing is security. Um, we were able to just like let our, cloud, our current cloud provider take care of a lot of the access for us, but if we're going to make a change, then we were going to have to control that access and uh, it was going to be our problem. So we needed to really make sure that we covered all of our bases. The third thing we need to understand is availability. Um, that, to me, that means that you need to understand how to monitor your application. You need to, you need to understand where your backups are, uh, disaster recovery, things like that. Again, you can rely <coughs> on uh, cloud providers to give that for you, but uh, you know, if you want to make this type of a change, you need to, do, to understand these types of things. The fourth is automation. Um, to me, that means you're either using Chef or Puppet, hopefully you're deploying with Capistrano or Vlad. And then the third option here is to really understand what platform you're on. So if you're on a, a Debian-based platform, look at De Debian packages, right? Uh, I've worked at an organization that we packaged up all of our Rails apps as a Debian package, and we used that to deploy instead of Capistrano. And that's a really interesting approach, and there are a lot of advantages to that. So you need, you need to own your own automation. And the fifth thing is we'll talk about a little bit later. So, uh, my first thought is we have these problems, these two pain points of customer domains and whitelists. What I want to do is I just want to go to the data center because data centers are safe. And data centers are safe because you have a private network that you can configure the way you want. And what I really wanted was a DMZ. I really wanted one subnet that was accessible from the outside and one subnet, that subnet could talk to all of the internal sub uh, other subnets, but uh, you couldn't go all the way through and talk directly to web servers or database servers. But in order to have your own data center, you usually have to buy some sort of load balancer router. And, uh, and those are expensive. And not like, like, you know, kind of expensive, like Heroku expensive, but they're like tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars expensive. Like that's a, it's crazy and it's a lot of money. And so when we were looking at that option, 
we looked at, our, at it from our perch in the cloud, and we thought, what? You know, we're just a startup. We don't have that kind of money. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to take all of the strengths of the data center and all of the strengths of the cloud, and together we would rule, right? So this is what we did. We uh, decided that we are going to stay in the cloud, but uh, we actually moved all of our infrastructure onto a virtual private cloud on Amazon's AWS service. And I like to think of, an a, of a, a VPC kind of like this, like a little piece of cloud that you cut out for yourself, and it's safe, and it's warm, and it embraces you. <laughs> so this is what it looks like. We're on the cloud, but in the cloud, we've got our own private network, right? And uh, within it, we've got our, our different subnets, so we can uh, control uh, access to each subnet with the router, and that's provided by Amazon. So within uh, our private or our public subnet, we have our load balancer, and this is actually an elastic load balancer, and this is a service that's managed by Amazon. And this was really great for us because that's one less thing that we have to do. So again, we gain all the, some of the benefits of being on the cloud of having services that you can rely on without actually having to manage them ourselves. And then everything else is just a typical EC2 server, right? So if you've done anything on uh, Amazon or Engineard, um, this is the same as everything else, only it's within a private network, a private cloud. So here's our network. When a request comes in, it goes to the load balancer. The load balancer hands it off to the web server. The web server goes back to the database server. It works just like everything else did. But we solved our domain problem by having a second load balancer, which is on a customer domain. And it's a new ELB instance. It's managed by... Amazon, and the great thing about this is that the customer certificate lives on the load balancer. So we don't have to manage any of the certificates on our own web servers. We don't have to worry about deploying new certificates to all of our web servers. We put it directly on the load balancer, and we move on. And it's a terrific solution. Request comes in to the customer, hit our, data, our web, web server, database server, just like everything else, just like before. Um, so that was our first problem, is just having multiple domains. And load balancers, these ELB systems are like 18 bucks a month. So they're, they're much more uh, much more cost effective. The second problem we had was adding new servers to our environment. And again, the virtual private cloud comes to our, our aid here, where it, another service that runs within the cloud is, a, is an at server, right? So all of our external connections coming from our backend subnets go through the NAT, and that NAT has a single public IP, right? And so all outbound connections are coming from the one IP. If we add capacity and then put traffic routes to those new servers, they're going to go through that same NAT, and they're going to be the same IP. So we can scale internally within our private cloud as much as we want, but we look exactly the same on the outside to all of our customers. So again, the five things were networking. Uh, we solved that by having our own subnets. Um, and we, saw, we kind of solved this concern slash pain that we had. So um, the thing I want to really highlight is that all of the IPs on each of these subnets are private IPs, right? So we have a range of IPs that go with, within each of these subnets. And that really helps for security because if you have requests coming in from the outside, they're not going to be able to access your servers because it's on a completely private network. So the request just kind of bounce out. You can't port scan our database server anymore. <coughs> that kind of opens up the question about what do we do when we have to access these servers to run maintenance or just kind of see what's going on, access log files. The only thing we have in our public subnet that we don't manage is a Bastion server. And this Bastion server allows SSH connections to come in, and then we SSH pass those keys back onto the backend servers as well. So. Request comes into the bastion, and from that bastion, we can access our web servers or our database servers. Okay, so the third thing we needed to make sure that we understood was availability. Uh, to us, that means upstart and monit. So we're monitoring all the processes, make sure that they're going to stay up. When they don't stay up, that we get notified. The other thing it means is backups. And so we take uh, EBS back, uh, snapshots of our database server and some of our other servers, but we also do dumps to S3 just to make sure that if something really, really goes bad, we can always go back to uh, a backup and, and recover. And then we also replicate outside of S3 in case Amazon goes completely tits up. Uh, the other thing that is really helpful for availability is New Relic and Pingdom. And New Relic has saved our bacon more than anything. I think that uh, if there's one 
one thing I would recommend to upgrade to was uh, upgrade new relic because that's just been invaluable for us. And then lastly on availability, the thing I kind of want to highlight is a really powerful combination of tools is cron and rake. Right? And we've used this, we've had so much success just using cron and rake. Simple rake task is going to go and look for, you know, maybe if a, if a, a job queue is getting out of whack or whatever, we automate that check, and if, if something goes bad, you know, we have a five minute window where we're going to check and, and maybe send an email. So that's a really powerful way to, to solve an immediate problem without having, you know, uh, adding additional uh, infrastructure to do really heavy monitoring. So the fourth thing is automation, and this is where we spent a lot of our time. And we uh, decided on Chef, and we love Chef. Chef's fantastic. And as an aside, um, this is a guy I work with. His name is Jason Roloffs. His Twitter is James Kilton. I don't know why his name and his Twitter handle are so completely different, but uh, <laughs> he's my hero. And he has done a, a really tremendous amount of work on automation on our new infrastructure. Um, so much so that he actually wrote his own AWS client called Simple AWS. You can get it here on GitHub. And it, it rocks my socks off. There are a lot of the other libraries, they didn't support absolutely everything that Amazon was supporting. And quite literally, we were rolling into production with features that Amazon would release a week beforehand. And the only way we could do that is by um, just having our own library, right? And so that's what he did, and uh, you should really check it out. It's not a lot of code, but there's a lot of functionality. We've automated almost as much as we, we seriously can. Um, in order to connect to any of our servers, we have a simple script that takes care of all of that Bastion uh, SSH key forwarding. So uh, you know, we have multiple uh, private clouds, one for production, one for staging, a couple others for uh, load balancing and stuff like that. So we have a script that we tell it which environment we want to go to and then which uh, type of server we want to go to, whether it's a utility server, or web server, or database servers. If we need to add new capacity, it's as simple as just a simple rake task right here. So uh, you see the server's new web, server's new DV, however we want to do it. Um, that hooks it completely into not just the, the, uh, the virtual private network, but it also makes all of the load balancers aware of it. Um, and then also to create a new load balancer, uh, we automate that as well. And this is something that I think is super cool and I haven't seen any other library be able to do. But uh, we run a rate cast to create the new cert files. We then uh, replace those cert files with the actual certificate we get from our customer. We then upload that certificate to Amazon so it's aware of it, and then we create a new load balancer for that domain certificate, and it's as simple as that, and it's, it's pretty freaking awesome. The fifth thing here is, is really courage. Um, and by courage, you have to have individual courage to try something new, but you also need institutional courage. You need a company that's going to allow you to, uh, to, to try something like this. Um, and I'm really grateful that I'm able to work at a company like Bloomfire, where uh, they would take a chance on a two-man team going off and making a radical change to our infrastructure. But we solved all of these pain points without actually making any changes to our application. We solved it completely on our infrastructure side. Um, and with that, we should be able to play this guy in 10 seconds flat. <laughs> So hopefully we can take control of our own cloud and be like Rainbow Dash, who seriously kicks ass. Um, so this is an experience report, so we have lots of time for questions, and I'd love to take any questions. Why did you Rainbow Dash this? Why did I Rainbow Dash you? I was expecting you guys to be drunk, and it would be a lot funnier. <laughs> well, I'm using that was IPv4. How do you plan on expanding to IPv6 and uh, Using the map? Yeah. How do we, uh, we have no plans for IP6 right now. So, and that's one of the things that uh, we actually, I would love that if uh, Amazon would support if they went to IP6 because we also don't have multicast within our private network. And if we had that, that would solve a lot of other issues that we have with some other pieces of our infrastructure that we have now and that we know we're coming later. So uh, it's not all roses, but um, we're much further ahead than what we were before. And also, we're spending less money than what we were spending before every month. Other one? Question? No. Yeah. 
Uh, our automation tools is it's like out of the box chef solo. Yeah, the chef solo and rake. I mean that's how what everything is. So there's there's not a whole lot to open source other than give you the keys to the kingdom and we're not gonna do that. Are you skipping the obscure platform stuff? Yeah, yeah. So we're not we're not using the chef uh, paid package, it's all chef solo. So we have a, a Git repository that has all of our chef recipes on it. And the first thing we do when we set up a new server is we install a uh, a SSL this is uh, hcert, so we can go talk to GitHub, and we pull that down, and we just do, uh, you know, get pull, and then reapply all those recipes. So it's all Chef Solo. Also, just did, uh, how do you share configuration with all those machines? How do we share configuration between the machines? So when we set up a new server, um, we go and we tag uh, each server within Amazon's infrastructure, so we know. You know, this, this server is a web server, this server is a database server, and whatever else. So we, we use that to, to label each server, and then we have all of the configuration mapping within, within Chef Solo. Yeah? Um, are you, in your Chef Solo recipes, are you doing something to simulate the data bag stuff that's in Hosted Chef? No. Okay. You know, we, we've got like a very, very simple approach with that. So um, we didn't want to pay for, for Chef, we just wanted to to use solo, and so we haven't really looked at, you know, what paid chef would offer us. And but so far, we don't really have any pain with using chef solo. So a concrete question would be: How do you uh, how do you list the users that you create? How do we list the users that we create? Yeah. Meaning the the user accounts on the box. Yes. We've only got one user account on each box, okay. and it's it's the the one that we stand up when. Uh, so in Amazon, when you stand up a new server, you run that. You have a, a script that you can run. And we just use that server to uh, that script to create like our our uh, right. the, the running user that's going to run nginx and everything else. And so when we SSH into it, we just use that same user account. So cool. it, it's not it's not it's not a, a full uh, root user, um, but we can sudo into it. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. What are we using New Relic for? Yeah, so uh, New Relic has, has added server monitoring, so uh, you can point New Relic to any server that is running within your environment, even if it's not running your your application. So uh, you can you can take the, the monitoring of all the processes on your database server and you know where, where RAM is and how what the CPU load is on any server within your environment with New Relic, and so. We're using that just because it's a little bit easier than um, stitching together Nagios and a bunch of other tools at the moment. But um, but I think New Relic is more than paid for itself. We've really relied on it, and we've been very happy with it so far. The only issue we, we haven't liked with New Relic is uh, error reporting. So we're still using Airbrake for, for catching errors and telling us when we have errors. So it's not quite as robust there, but pretty much everything else has really met our needs. We don't really feel any pain with it. The cost difference between running it yourself and running it in the cloud? Um, well, we were on Engine Yard before, and uh, even um, upgrading New Relic and uh, running you know, the cloud and all that, we're actually, it's less money for us every month. We got 10% less doing it ourselves, even paying for the additional services. Okay, thank you everybody.